Welcome on in, golf fans. It's your boy, GS Luke, here with our weekly course breakdown. This time, we've got my hometown event, the Honda Classic, a course that brings on carnage every single year. Truly a Florida-style course with water in play, winds that'll kick up, and conditions that lead to a well over par scoring average. So looking forward to it. And in this video, going to break down everything you need to know about the venue. We'll go through some of the course details, make sure we're on the same page, go hole by hole through PGA National, give you an idea of some of the golf shots that will be facing these tour pros, and then at the end, going to go through a few of the key stats and a few of the other comparison courses around the PGA Tour that I'm using to try and identify my top plays. The idea here is to set you up to go out there and get your research started to hopefully go and smash out there. I mean, last week for the Genesis, one of the strongest fields that you're going to see all week ended up being a solid one on the DFS side. Lots of near takedowns in the Discord over there on the Patreon. Outright Benning didn't end up hitting on John Rum, but still a solid week of ROI and, like I said, an extremely high end field and entertaining event. Congrats to John Rom. Well deserved on being world number one there, but we really couldn't have a different looking field and event this week. The course going to play even more difficult, a lot of that due to that water, and the field strength, not really that top end elevated field. So a few things that are moving around this week, even more so than most, is all about the research. Up top, you're not going to have those studs, those top five, top 10 players in the world. So using analysis, using custom modeling, all that sort of fun stuff is even more important and helpful for these sort of fields. So looking forward to it, guys. A lot to break down. Let's go ahead and get this thing rocking. Alrighty, so the course this week, PGA National, the champions course over there at the resort. There's, I believe, five courses on property. The only one that I've played is the champion course. Of course, wanted to play where the pros did, and I've actually gone over there four times. So have some in-person experience. Uh, the course hasn't changed very much over the years. Um, ever since 2022, they have removed a bunker, and I believe holes 16 and 17, but still over 60 punkers on property. And I believe the ones that took away... I'm actually not entirely sure which ones they were, um, were well out of the way, right? They weren't one of the greenside bunkers, um, one of the fairway bunkers where a lot of players were hitting into them. It was a bunker that wasn't seeing much action. So instead of, you know, requiring all of that upkeep, they just took it off property. So um, not that much has changed here over the years, extremely familiar and a staple on the PGA Tour that we might not see a bunch going forward. Unfortunately, the Tour's relationship with Honda is going to be ending after this year. So it's unsure whether another sponsor is going to come in and just take over this slot at the same golf course or a new sponsor could potentially come in and completely change it up. So I'm going to relish this last opportunity if it ends up indeed being the last opportunity for us to see a PGA National, because truly it's at least a top five course on the PGA Tour for me when it comes to just my favorite, most entertaining courses to watch. Um, it really could even be top three. So a few things to note. It's a quintessential Florida golf course. Water and plate on 15 of 18 holes, winds that'll kick up down here in Palm Beach Gardens, and you're going to get those similar kind of players that play well here at the players that play well on Valspar year in and year out that are just perhaps better suited for these conditions, or maybe that have a little bit more experience on them. So that's something that we'll talk about when we get to the key stats, looking at some of the players that have had success during this part of the schedule. Uh, but a few things that I want to touch on, just a few specifics, details we got to iron out here so it's a par 70 typically plays as a par 72 for resort guests so my personal best score here of course again i have a little bit of experience around um is a 79 so that's from the tips it's on a par 72 um wasn't really that windy that day so i do have the something called the luke line out there if somebody goes out there and shoots an 80 or worst i essentially blacklist them at this event because if they can't beat my best score around here uh they don't even deserve to be in contention so uh that's my best score here. It's a tough track, 7,125 yards. So it's not the length that gets it done, even for somebody like me that hits it a solid 20, 25 yards shorter than these tour pros. Um, I had no problem hitting something like 
I think the longest iron I had into a par four um, was probably a four iron. And that was on hole number five. Uh, actually, that's par three. Um, hole number seven ended up being on one of the longer par threes on property. You'll hit like a four iron off the tee there. Um, you might hit a three iron if you're into a headwind. Um, it's not really a long course. A lot of the difficulty comes with the water. A lot of penalty shots around this track. Um, but the difficulty of the greens they have some of the more subtle contouring to them they run at 12s they're bermuda surfaces that run pure i mean you're not going to have any sort of bumps on them like you had with the poa um, people aren't going to be missing from four to five feet as often like you saw over there in the west coast but those 10 to 20 foot putts are extremely difficult to read and you're going to see a lot of three putts even from like 20 25 feet um, part of that is due to the sloping again hard to read greens over there at pga national um, but also that adds difficulty with the around the green shots so when you hit a ball into a bunker around here they tend to be some of the deeper green side bunkers that we see for any pga tour tracks um, so a lot of the difficulty which led to a 1.3 four it's actually 1.34 so a 71.34 average there last year um, so well over par scoring average uh, wasn't because of the distance wasn't really because of the ball striking test so much as on and around the greens so last year in terms of penalty shots it had the most on tour by far 0.69 penalty shots per round there are 60 bunkers on property water and plate and 15 of 18 holes like i was mentioning before the greens are about your average size greens so they're not small like a pebble beach they're not massive like a saint andrews right around 7,000 square foot the gar percentage was slightly lower than tour average so right around 65 percent which is about three percent lower than what we see week to week so again you know you know not a long course the greens aren't all that hard to hit right maybe slightly harder to hit than average um, but they do run fast right 12 on the stint meter and something that you can't really get an appreciation for i mean even when we go hole by hole um, are just the slopes on the greens um, they're not really severe they're not like an augusta national a muirfield village sloped where you're going to see like tiers that just have massive runoff areas it's more so inner inner green breaks where you have double breakers on some of those 20 30 foot putts um, that can really trip up these players the fairways are a celebration bermuda so the grass on the greens is actually a tiff eagle bermuda um, not really anything to distinguish there um, but the fairways despite only being 29.7 yards wide which is a whole about five yards narrower than what we're used to seeing um, we're hit at a 68.2 percent clip which is actually higher than your tour average so smaller targets hit more than your tour average because of how many people were laying up it's only 7100 yards there's a few par fours where you have to lay up off the tee just due to some of the landing areas and then on a lot of the you know mid to, let's say like 400 to 450 yard par fours you don't even have to hit driver to begin with you're still going to have a wedge into a majority of those shorter par fours um, so you see a relatively high fairway average so that might seem like you want to look for driving first players right in terms of accuracy guys that maybe prioritize um, that precision over their power but it's actually the opposite and we'll talk about why they're a little bit later and it's less so about the distance off the tee and more so about the distance into greens some of the par threes are gnarly over 200 yards the par fives are only reachable by the longest players on tour so for a few of the trickier holes a few of the risk reward kind of scenarios you have to have that distance to leverage that and uh, again we'll get into the key stats a little bit later but uh, it's just, it's kind of it's a strange course right the ball striking isn't all that difficult um so you would probably think that it would play under par but because of how difficult the greens are and when you miss around here you are penalized beyond belief right you miss a fairway a lot of times you're in the water right you miss a green a good amount of time you're in the water around this track um, that adds to the difficulty here there, but also even when you're missing in the rough or in one of these greenside bunkers, um, some of the most difficult shots to get up and down. The rough is only two and a half inches, but it is a Bermuda grass rough with a perennial rye grass overseed um, that tends to play relatively sticky like they do at all Florida golf courses, uh, which led to a missed fairway penalty of about a third of a shot last year. So pretty standard for what you're seeing at most Bermuda tracks uh, and definitely more gnarly than what you saw over there, even with the Kikuya around the Genesis uh, and then the the over there the poa that they have there on the west coast is essentially non-existent these guys hit out of that with no issues especially at some of the desert golf courses um, when you get down to florida you get that sticky bermuda grass there is a legit penalty to missing the fairways and like i said just over a third of a stroke in fact every time you do so 
All right, now let's look at this place hole by hole. So hole number one is easy as it's going to get, but still not all that simple of an opening hole. You do have the water down to the left, isn't really in play. It's a solid like 30 yards offline. What's more the issue is this fairway bunker, which makes a lot of the distance control into this green difficult, or even the trees to the right. You have OB over there on the driving range. These trees are extremely dense. So you miss this fairway, you end up in this Bermuda grass rough, which I talked about being extremely sticky before. Um, it's nowhere near the handshake that it can be. You move it down there with the driving iron off the tee. Um, that's really the conservative line that they have on here. Um, if you do take a driver, you could push it down there even close to the surface, but you bring the water into play if you do so. You do bring even more so the OB and these trees down the right. So a majority of the players will be a little bit more conservative, still taking it out to right around the edge of this bunker. Um, and no matter where you're at, you're gonna have a wedge into the green. It's just more a question of whether you're in the rough, whether you're hitting your third shot because you take a drop out of the water, um, so on and so forth. The green surface is large. So a few things I want to you know, point out here is that a lot of the bunkers are just massive. They pretty much cover the entire side of a lot of the greens around here, a lot of the green complexes. And you have a lot of these chip off areas, little runoff areas where the greens, though they're right around 7,000 square foot, when you use a back right pin location or even a front right pin, you bring all of this into play. Everything slopes down to these little runoff areas. Um, those are for drainage purposes, of course, down here in South Florida, where we get tons of rain pretty much every single day. Um, it makes a few of those side pin locations here even more difficult for these players. A few other things to note, the weather of late has been extremely dry. There has not been very much precipitation, at least over the last two weeks down here. Um, though it's still the winter in Florida, we're gonna get a lot more rain than most of the country. I would expect the course to maybe even be a little bit firmer and faster than what you're used to seeing. Hole two is 465. It's a bear of a hole. Um, another tough tee shot. Um, it's got a weird angle off the tee. You see a lot of players missing in the fairway bunker to the right, um, or even over here in the natural area to the left. And you can see here, there's just pine straw there, a bunch of trees. Um, if you end up over here, you're pretty much chipping out sideways every single time. You miss over here to the right. Uh, there is another OB over there with those houses. Um, not really in play unless you're shanking it off the tee, but still, you're getting the idea here, right? You're not going to be able to sleep off the tee. Um, some of the longer players can take the bunkers out of play. Um, they are bringing in some of the natural areas when you hit driver, uh, but that's kind of the added bonus of driving distance. Not only do you have shorter clubs into greens, you're more equipped to take on those long par three. Threes, um, but you can take out a little bit of trouble off the tee as well. Hole three is your first par five, uh, the only par five of the front nine. Again, remember on here it's set up for a par 72, so a lot of the you know par numbers you're seeing on the right side of the screen um, aren't necessarily going to be accurate. Uh, but this one is a par five. It tends to be on the shorter end, mostly plays into the wind though, so you're not going to see a ton of people getting to this green in two. Um, if you miss the fairway, it's almost a for sure layup because of that gnarly Bermuda rough. Um, up there, you do have water to the left. It's not really in play, again, unless you completely shank it coming into this green. Um, and usually, if you're hitting an iron, it's pretty much out of play. Um, the water over the green is out of play as well. Um, the real issue here is that when it plays into the wind, it plays closer to 600 yards, right? Not this 540-yard mark that you see there. Uh, if it ends up playing downed wind for whatever reason, which I have yet to see in person here at the Honda Classic, um, this could be a really easy hole. It's just that we don't see that very often. Hole four is 394. It's one of the easier holes on property. Um, and they give you three, the par five, and then four, a relatively easy hole uh, before the hardest stretch um, on the PGA Tour. So the bear trap gets a lot of attention here. Um, that's holes, what is it? 15, 16, and 17 at this track. Um, if realistically, five through seven are even more difficult. So you take advantage of the short par four. The tee shot's difficult. You do have an angle. Um, you, it's kind of angled from right to left here. Um, there are, is some slope here from right to left as well. I'm kind of helping you hold this fairway, but a lot of people are gonna push through into the right over here. Um, it's a, just hard to hold it, especially if it's gonna be firm and fast this time around at PJ National. Um, gonna be even more difficult to hold this kind of fairway. You're hitting it at an angle. So um, it's a little bit more difficult than it looks, but it's still only a 400 yard par four. So if you get it in the short stuff or a decent lie, even in that Bermuda rough, 
um, a birdie opportunity for everybody, and you need it. Because hole five is a bear. It's a 220 yard par three, water the whole way up. The chipping area to the right isn't that much easier. There's a ton of undulation on the surface. If you miss the screen, of course, to the left, you're done, right? You're looking at a double bogey. You miss to the right, you're going to have a hard time making bogey as well. So it's a well thought out hole. You need to execute a solid long iron shot. And it's these kind of holes that are plentiful around this track that make driving distance a huge thing because the shorter hitters could be hitting a three wood into this green, especially if it's playing into the fan, which again, it usually comes from the right side here, but sometimes it'll come from like the, um, I'd say like top left side, right? So kind of out of the Northeast, if this was oriented North right here, um, it's not obviously, but uh, it's a, a extremely long hole that can play even longer in some of the wind conditions. Hole six is listed as a par five, but it plays as a par four for these tour pros. If they don't shorten it, they play it from way back there at its true length. And uh, you have the watered hole way down the left. You'll see a few players, um, because the fairway is sloped from right to left, actually run down into the natural area and stand in the water and hit approach shots back into the fairway. Um, I know last year there was a guy that took off his pants and went down there, ended up going in all the um, news channels and all that sort of fun stuff. But uh, you can't lay up here, right? So they have the layup area down there before the green. There's going to be a lot of players that end up there anyways. Um, this is a par four, right? So you're not intentionally laying up. But if you end up in that gnarly Bermuda rough, you can't get home on two on a 500 yard par four. It's not like you're hitting out of that POA or some of those West Coast rye grasses uh, that aren't nearly as sticky as what you get over here. So difficult hole, probably the most difficult hole on property, I would say. Um, hole seven, a 224 yard par three. So if you thought that five was tough, this is arguably just as tough. Now there's not water in play here, but these fairway bunkers, or I should say greenside bunkers, um, are extremely difficult to get up and down out of. And this rough to the left side over here is going to be overused. You're going to see a ton of people that pull their iron shots over there, trying to get a little bit extra on something like a five iron, um, just because of how long and you know brutal this hole can play. I um, mean, kind of like hole number five. There's a few times when both holes five and seven play both directly into the wind. Um, it can just be absolute brutes. Hole eight is 426 yards. Um, it's one of the you know forced layups that you have on property. So I talked about that a few times. You've seen that at holes like number one, right, where you're kind of incentivized to lay up off the tee. Same thing with here with hole number eight, right? You can't hit it, the driver. You're going to end up in the water there. Um, at the very least, you bring water into play. So most players are going to hit a three wood, maybe even a driving iron off the tee, setting up a wedge into the green. So it is a birdie look but one of the smaller surfaces on property too. So you have to be precise to hit the green and uh, you are gonna see quite a few birdies there, that's for sure. Hole nine is 425 yards. Another tee shot that's difficult because of the angle off the tee, you can see that the fairway is sloped from right side to left. Uh, that makes holding this extremely difficult unless you hit a draw off the tee. Um, the fairway bunker to the right here is deep, makes approach shots extremely difficult. And this natural area to the left, this little alcove, gets a lot more attention from these tour pros than you probably think they would, right? You would think most of them would bail out to the right, uh, but you will see a few miss over there to the left and potentially even get in the water from time to time. So a tough hole, just tough track in general if you couldn't get that general idea and a hole that you're looking to make par on and move on. Getting to the back nine, hole 10 is listed as a 548 yard par five, but it's actually a par four. So they play it from this tee box up here about 40 yards shorter, still a 510 yard hole that is nearly impossible to par. I mean, you're gonna see more people make bogey on this hole than birdie for sure. And sometimes more people making bogey here than pars. Um, the tee shot's difficult. It's another hole where if you're one of the longer players on tour, you can take this bunker out of play because again, they're using the up tee box. You can see people just smashing it over the corner here, which is going to leave you about 180, 190 yards in, but it's still a real tough tee shot because then, you know, rather than the right to left angling of the fairway, now you're dealing with the left to right angling, which means unless you can hit that high fade around the corner, you're going to have next to no shot to hitting this. Um, so this is really where driving distance becomes a huge factor, not just on those par threes, but on some of these more difficult par fours where no one's going to hit the fairway to begin with, so you might as well be down there 310, 320 yards. 
Hold number 11 is 445. Really difficult second shot. Um, even the tee shot can be a little bit worrisome. You'll see people miss it in this hazard to the right, particularly if you're using a driver. Um, it's only about 300 yards to get there. Or even over here to the left, the cart path will take a few souls, you know, take those balls, put them into the drink over there. Lots of gators in that lake, I have to say that too. And over here to the right, lots of lake um, gators in that lake. And with the approach shot, you've got water in play too. So if you miss the fairway, you're screwed coming into this green. Uh, a lot of people are going to miss long there, which leaves extremely difficult around the green shots. And then of course, you're going to see a bunch of water balls. So 11's a brute, you know, 10 was a brute, same thing with 11. 12 is 444. It's another difficult tee shot because of the angle. You have to hit a fade off the tee or you're going to have next to no shot of holding this fairway. And one of the larger greens on property, there's a huge build out here looking over the green. Uh, I'll be up there every once in a while going, uh, getting a brewski or two up there. They have a nice bar up there, usually the Corona bar. So uh, I visit every once in a while, but another difficult hole, right? And you're, you're going to hear me say that just over and over. Hole, hole 13, I actually don't walk down this hole very often just because it's kind of like in its middle of nowhere over here in the corner of the course. There's like nothing over there infrastructure wise, but it's 389. It's actually a birdie hole if you can get the ball in the fairway um, next to nobody's going to hit a driver here. So hit, execute a solid shot off the tee. You are going to have a birdie look and uh, you're going to need it. Um, hole 14 pretty difficult hole. Um, it's not technically part of the bear trap, so uh, it's not as difficult as what you're going to get to. But 14, pretty tricky, but uh, 15 through 17 is that infamous bear trap that I was talking about. So, you know, when you get a hole like 13 that was as straightforward as it was, you have to take advantage of it. It is just all that much more important. You know, 462, this hole can play into the wind from time to time as well, kind of like those two par threes, five and seven. It's in that same kind of direction. Um, your tee shot doesn't have that much trouble in play. No one's really going to hit it to the right over here. Um, but the approach shot, of course, you've got the water to the right, um, and it tends to be one of the more sloped greens on property. But now we get to the bear trap. 15, a 177 yard par three. You've got the water to the right, this bunker to the left that seemingly has a magnet in it. And you're gonna see a lot of players that hit it into this bunker that chip into the water. Everything slopes from the left side to the right. These greens are lightning. We're gonna be even faster this year because of the lack of rain. And uh, this is the start of the good old bear trap because at this point you're just praying to make par and moving on. Hole 16, same thing. Difficult tee shot. It's a forced layup. You literally cannot hit driver here physically. There's no reason to. Um, every player is going to hit an iron off the tee. It's actually a harder to hit fairway than you'd think, even with people using an iron here. You're going to see guys that miss to the left in this fairway bunker, and you're going to see a few people even put it in the drink off the tee, which is kind of embarrassing for having an iron, but it happens every year. And uh, the approach shot, Though water isn't a huge factor here, right? It's the green isn't butted up against the side there. This bunker shot is one of the more difficult on property. And the green in general, though it's massive, a large target is heavily tiered. There's a tier up here to the back left, a tier to the right side. This runoff area collects a lot of balls and repels them 10, 15 yards down. Um, just brutally difficult hole. And it's probably the easiest of the bear trap, truth be told, because hole 17 is your crown jewel. This is the most difficult hole under pressure, um, not the most difficult hole on property. So the bear trap, right? You know, 15, 16, 17, not even the most difficult stretch on the course, right? That's five through seven. That's more difficult. Arguably 10 through 12 is even more difficult than this three hole stretch, but it, it gets all the fame because this is where the PGA logo is. It's where all the massive build outs are. It's where I'll be. This is where my all inclusive package will be for the week. Um, but the water's in play, of course. You'll see people that hit the green and then roll over the back here because this bank here is extremely steep, isn't going to stop anything. And uh, the bunker shot, just like you had there at 16, is one of the most difficult on tour. In fact, you'll see people chipping out of there that chip into the water. So just a, a fun hole, fun stretch there. And finally at 18, after all of that carnage gets to you, you're probably like five over par at best. 
you get to 18, which is a par five. So you can get a few shots back here. Um, it's by no means easy to reach in two. If you get it out there in the fairway, you're gonna have like 250 yards in, but depending on your angle, which to get it in the fairway, you have to set up an even worse angle into the green, um, you're gonna have a lot of water to carry. And if it's this back right pin, you have no business going for that pin location. You just hit it to the fat of the green, hope that you hit the surface and two putt for a birdie. A lot of people are gonna be laying up though. This rough is, again, gnarly. It's that Bermuda grass. These ferry bunkers are too deep to try and go for the green. Um, and if you're dealing with any sort of wind into you, which, again, it all depends on the wind locations. It changes from round to round, makes this hole even more difficult. So a great closing hole. You could see somebody go out there and make an eagle really charge up the leaderboard um, or go out there, make a bogey, potentially even a double bogey with those tough back right pin locations and eject themselves on hole 72. Alrighty guys, now that we've seen this golf course, let's talk about a few of the key metrics I'm using this week to identify my top plays. At number one, we've got shots gained putting on Bermuda grass. And with those tough greens, the contouring, how fast they run down here in Florida, you really want to look at guys that not only excel in general with their putting, but on this Bermuda grass surface, these Tiff Eagle greens have a lot of grain to them. There's shiny, there's all those dark spots, and it helps you out with your reading of greens. I mean, as somebody that's native to South Florida, when I'm on Bermuda Greens, I feel a lot more comfortable with my reads than on any other surface. In fact, without all of those dark and shiny spots, it's hard for me to really get an idea for some of the slopes that you're looking at because that green oftentimes runs down slopes, gives you that visual component to the read that you're looking at and not just trying to feel it out um, visually. So for some players, they tend to have a lot of success on these greens. And for the people that maybe aren't so familiar, they tend to struggle. So that's the number one key stat I'm looking at. Putting is typically not the number one thing I'm looking at here, but with a slightly weaker than usual field, a lot of those elite level ball strikers, the top end iron players, off the tee players that you see on tour, aren't going to be present in this field. It's more so some of the putting specialists that really tend to differentiate themselves. At number two, we do have shots gained approach though. So, you know, I know it wasn't going to, you know, stay down for very long, right? It's the most important stat week to week. It's usually number one here on the list, but really this week what I want to hunker down on because you guys know, right? Iron play, important, right? You want to be looking at recent form when it comes to iron play. But those mid-iron ranges, the 125 to 150, that 150 to 175, or even the 175 to 200 yard range are overutilized here at PGA National compared to any other course on tour. And those wedge ranges, right, that 50 to 125 yard range, or those 200 yard plus buckets tend to be slightly underutilized compared to your PGA Tour average. So that's something to consider when you're looking at those mid-tier ranges. Guys that long-term, maybe over the last two, three seasons, have been standout players, might be worth a few extra looks this week. At number three, we've got driving distance, something where hole by hole, you got a better appreciation for why that driving distance would be important. And though players aren't going to have driver in hand for, let's say, maybe but like six, seven tee shots around PGA National, it's going to be helpful on the par threes, extremely helpful in trying to get home in two on the par fives. And for some of the more drivable holes where you can take out bunkers, be a little bit more aggressive off the tee. The Bombers are going to have a lot more leeway in doing so. So it's something that I'm looking at. If you look at some of the past champions, top five, top tens, especially over the last two, three years at PJ National, you've seen some of the longer hitters have success. In terms of other key stats, bogey avoidance at a difficult track, always worth looking at. Par four scoring because of the par 70 setup, right? There's an extra two par fours. Looking at around the green play at a difficult track. Um, alongside, you know, shots gained putting, when you have these difficult contoured greens, that's something that I consider. Sand saves, a bunch of bunkers around property, a bunch of tough bunkers too. So um, anytime the difficulty goes up, you want to emphasize that a little bit more. Shots gained approach at a Bermuda rough. So when you're missing the fairways, I want to look at players that have maybe had success over the last two, three years out of Bermuda rough driving accuracy, and then shots gained for the Florida swing, which I talked about it towards the beginning half of the video, but there's guys that just tend to have a good time this time of year, right? Sun GM comes to mind. Chris Kirk has a ton of success at the Florida golf courses. There's similar agronomy. We know that there's a lot of water around these tracks. So the more precise bogey avoidance sort of players 
tend to have success down here in Florida. Um, so trying to like take a look at those players. And then, of course, taking a look at our shots gained at comp courses, which we're going to go ahead and outline now. Our comp courses, the few tracks around the PGA Tour that should play similar to what you're going to see here for PGA National. So at number one, we've got TPC Southwind, another track with a bunch of water in play over there for the first leg of the playoffs the last few years. Um, bunch of water and also a Bermuda grass track. So from the agronomy and the ball striking perspective, you see a lot of crossover, tons of penalty strokes across both tracks, and those scoring tends to be a little bit better around south wind it's still really hard to go out there take it to something like 15 to 20 under par so crossover from the ball striking from the scoring average perspective agronomy um, and that's why it's there at number one at number two we have tpc sawgrass the home of the players championship and though has slightly less water than a south wind of course less water than a pga national it has a lot of you know similar difficulty around the green and on the greens so you still have some water right you still get the florida effect when it comes to weather, when it comes to those windy conditions. And then the green complexes are pretty much at that same level of difficulty. Lots of subtle breaks. They tend to run extremely fast around the Players' Championship. And though the greens at the Players are a hybrid surface and tend to be slightly different than the true Tiff Eagle greens that you get here at the Honda Classic, um, still something that you can use for some crossover analysis, uh, particularly when it comes to the around the green and the putting across both tracks. And then lastly, we've got Muirfield Village Golf Club, which is the home of the Memorial Tournament, which from the agronomy perspective, lots of differences, but plenty of water around Muirfield. And once again, really difficult greens. Fast greens, a little bit more undulation, I would say, than even a player championship or what you're going to have here at the Honda. But a lot of the same kind of skill sets are what you're looking for. And Billy Horschel, who's kind of like the Florida golf guru, right? He's got the perfect game down here in Florida, won the Muirfield Village this year. So not only are you looking at a lot of crossover in terms of champions, you're looking from the skill set perspective, also the correlation perspective, a lot of similarities between the courses. So yeah, those are three tracks that you can use. T maybe take a look at the leaderboards, some of the shots gained from each track especially, and use that to try and find some of those diamonds in the rough. All right, guys, that is all I've got for this week's course breakdown. I appreciate you stopping by, consuming the content. Really looking forward to this week. I mean, I'll be there all week. Also be there on Wednesday for the practice round. So you're going to have a lot of extra insight for you. Content's going to be coming out a little bit earlier so I can get out there on Wednesday, get a few scouting notes for you guys, and look out for some sort of update on Wednesday, whether it's on the live stream, perhaps even an extra piece of content that I'm posting here on the channel. But what I saw during the Pro-Am, whether it was conditions, the firmness of the greens, a few players that were maybe striping it, maybe a few things I saw on the driving range, whether it was injury concerns, maybe guys that seemed to be working on their swing more than others. Uh, there's an added benefit to having boots on the ground. And not only are you gonna have them here for this week at the Honda, but also, for the API up there in Orlando. I'll be there for at the very least over the weekend. Might actually go up for all four days. And the Players' Championship in Valspar. I'm going to be there for both of those events the entire weekend. So really my favorite month of the year, right? Just back to back to back to back events that I'm going to. And uh, excited to bring you guys the extra insight. So like I said, guys, appreciate you stopping by. Before you're hopping out of here, go ahead and comment what you think the winning score is going to be this week on the comments. I'm going to go ahead and take 11 under par, right? So in the kind of range that we've seen for the last three, four years, it's kind of hard to know without having a wind forecast before. If we end up getting some nasty windstorms coming through, might even be single digits under par. But go ahead and let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Go ahead, smash that like button too if you haven't already done so, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so you don't miss any of that content in the future. Whether it's a live stream on Wednesday, we'll be talking about everything I saw on the course, my core plays, which will be dropping tomorrow morning, going over my top four bets and top four fantasy plays of the week, or value plays, all the other showdown and prize picks content I'm posting over the weekend. Just Pretty much every day, something golf related getting posted here on the channel. And I aim to be one of the best, if not the best resources out there to help you along the way. Best of luck, guys. Hopefully we can go out there and smash after once again, just another profitable week there at the Genesis. And let's get this cash, fellas. <music>